Yep. All right. So let's start, um, shall we? So thanks everyone for joining today. I hope you are enjoying the nice weather today. <laughs> um, yeah. So so we are super excited to share you uh, one of the journeys that we are going in our organization. Um, it also it's been a bit of a game changer for us. So it's about evolving GitOps by tapping into the power of uh, Kubernetes resource model. Before I start, let me paint a picture. Um, imagine you are going through a cross-country road trip. On one hand, you have a static paper map, and on the other hand, you have a, um, a, a mobile application like Google Maps or Apple Maps to navigate your uh, journey. The static paper map, it's fixed. It's quite static. Um, it's unchanging. It's overwhelming. Uh, and also, it's very hard for the users to navigate their path. And this is how we are experiencing the current GitOps uh, in our implementation. On the other hand, you have um, a dynamic um, a changes, but it, uh, a tool uh, uh, like similar to Apple Maps or Google Maps. It, it's dynamic, changes based on your traffic conditions. Um, it's also more focused and also simple to navigate. And this is where we want to head towards in our GitOps uh, way of working by introducing the Kubernetes resource model. With that, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ashan Senevratna. I'm the product owner of the Mobile Cloud Native Automation team at Swisscom. And my name is Joel Studler. Very nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. I'm a DevOps engineer in the same team at Swisscom. Swisscom is the major Swiss telco provider. Uh, it's also an IT solutions provider. And uh, the company is currently on the move of being a pure telco uh, to being a more of a tech company. Uh, we call this from telco to techco. If you're interested in that topic, there is a talk by our CTO about that, uh, where he talks about this transition, uh, what it means for Swisscom as a whole. Um, just a few things to point out what's relevant for us. So first, we need uh, to achieve that, we need cloud nativeness, uh, we need simplicity in our automations, and we need automation moving to a more um, intense driven uh, declarative model of automation. Um, so the title of the talk is about the 5G core. So let's start um, with what a 5G core is. So on this picture you see um, a very simplified view of the ecosystem that we're talking about. On the very top you see like the, the cell phones, the smartphone you have in your pocket um, and then the antenna and the connection to the actual core. So everything in the white box, uh, the white box is a Kubernetes cluster, everything in there is the 5G core. Uh, each blue box is an app in the end. It's uh, like a microservice in this whole thing that builds the 5G core. Uh, in the mobile network, we have special names for things, so we call it network function. In this case, since it's running on Kubernetes, it's a containerized network function. But in the end, it's, a, it's just an app. Um, it could be a router, like forwarding actual traffic, or it could also be something like an authentication service or so on. Each blue box is a Helm chart, uh, which will result in one or more Helm releases. So that means we configure these boxes using Helm values. But not, not only that, we also have other interfaces that we somehow um, uh, like as an industry, so we use inter configuration interfaces such as netconf. Uh, that will heavily complicate things in our journey. Um, talking about scale, a small dev environment of this 5G core contains of roughly 2,000 pods and around about 5,000 different configuration parameters. So it's quite, um, quite a huge thing. Yeah. So before we, before we move forward, uh, uh, hands up those who are from the telco space, like operator or working with the vendors. All right, that's like one third of the room, so that's good. <laughs> um, it's not limited to telco enemies, um, what we're going to discuss about. So, uh, so let's look into the current state of the 5G core configuration. Um, this is a very simplified um, overview of the GitOps flow that we have. Um, we have the configuration, or the engineers work on prepare the configuration first. It, either it could be a configuration manifest or deployment, or Helm Helm values and such. It, they've been pushed to GitLab. Um, that's our CI tool, and Flux is the main continuous deployment tool that we use. It's a cloud-native tool, uh, a CNCF tool, 
and um, Flux reads these files and uh, they, it, then it uh, synchronizes into the Kubernetes layer. Now, the whole GitOps journey and a bit more in-depth uh, overview of our tooling landscape, we have discussed this in the, uh, presented this in our, one of our previous talks at KubeCon Europe, so feel free to check it out. Uh, it was done six months back. Um, now, with this setup, what we've achieved is we've achieved uh, Git as a source of truth. Uh, it's version immutable. We also have the continuous reconciliation going, and we also have everything instead uh, on uh, what we want. In the now, this looks all good, but uh, where's, the, where's the problem statement or where we're lacking the, uh, the, or where we have these challenges? Let's look into one of the config files in the 5G core. So this is uh, how a typical config looks like. It's a sm small part of it. <laughs> Doesn't even fit into the screen. Um, and if you look into it, if you zoom in a bit on this, you see there's a lot of IP addresses, VLANs, DNS records, uh, certificate references, and you name it. So the problem here is we have lack of abstraction on the configurations that we have. So the users, uh, they need to statically define the IP addresses, DNS um, records, VLAN IDs, and also interdependent config parameters and such, which make our lives super hard. And also it's not, not much of a like, fun thing to manage in the end. So in our configuration, uh, we have uh, discovered several unsolved problems which introduce toil into our config management system. The first is the sheer complexity that the 5G core introduces. Uh, as Joel mentioned, we have tons of pods and um, config parameters, there are interdependencies and such. So it's not that user friendly. Um, the second is um, there are repeated parameters that we have to use in our config manifest or Helm charts. One example is if you want to set up the BGP peering, you need to reference the VLAN IDs or AS numbers on the both sides. The next is in our system, we have limited config discovery. So the system is not that smart enough to um, discover the configurations by itself. Uh, so, uh, which means we need to um, mention all the details upfront. Uh, for an example, the IP addresses and VLANs. So this whole process then in the end, it sort of summarizes into taking an outside to in approach. So instructions are pushed into the system from the outside world. So the goal for us is to flip this around. So uh, by the way, by the way, there's a nice article on the, uh, from the Google um, team. Uh, they have written a nice article on configuration design. Uh, it's part of this uh, SRE workbook. So please check out if, you, if you're interested on this config topic. So again, so our goal is to flip this around. So what if, we, what if we can do, instead of telling the system how to do everything, we tell the system what we want and the system is smart enough to figure it out on the best possible way to make it happen. Yeah, so that's the, the whole intent-driven automation approach that we want to take. So let's break it down. So the first step is the CNF receives the intent to move to an operational state without step-by-step -step instructions. So you pass a high-level intent. And we treat this, uh, so rather than mentioning DNS records or uh, references or VLAN IDs or IP addresses, we treat them as functions and they're able to um, discover the relevant information automatically by talking to the uh, external systems. So it's taking this inside out approach. So rather than pushing the information into the system, it pulls the relevant information from outside sources. With that, we would also like to um, bring the Kubernetes native capabilities. So what if we can achieve this by extending the Kubernetes API? So in order to achieve this, uh, we would like to introduce the Kubernetes resource model, um, or also stands for KRM. Um, is everyone familiar with the term or the, the approach? Good, okay, there's one person or two, person, two people. <laughs> yeah, so what's Kubernetes resource model? So, so KRM, it allows us to uh, extend the Kubernetes API. Um, with KRM, we can create custom resource definitions or CRDs, where it allows us to um, have API defini definitions on the, on the Kubernetes layer. So once you have this CRD or the Kubernetes resource definitions, we can create custom resources 
they are uh, basically instances of the uh, newly defined APIs. And using operators or templates, we can uh, handle this business logic under the um, behind the scenes. Uh, for an example, we can start using them for assembling a config dynamically or um, capabilities such as like self healing. So, in order to achieve this, um, we need to find a tool, and uh, we have few checkboxes. So we need to go. Uh, let's let's revisit them, and see if 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 we can find a tool uh, based on these needs. So the first is it has to be fully KRM. Uh, so we want to uh, this tool to be fit into the Kubernetes world. Um, garbage collection is important. So if you have any uh, real related resources, they need to be managed together. Um, the generated resources uh, needs to be stored with the various backends, so we need to have this flexibility. Reconciliation is super important, right? So if, you, if, you, if the input is changed, we need to automatically reflect this change in the output. And also in order to have these custom functions. Um, so in order to get status field from K Kubernetes custom resources and such. And lastly, uh, because maybe it's because we start with this static config or very similar to this paper map example. We don't want to flip a switch overnight to transition into this dynamic uh, approach. We want to have a gradual uh, uh, adaption uh, and also take it at own phase. Now you might be thinking we, we presented Flux and also we mentioned Helm. So what about these other tools like Helm, Customization, Argo and Flux and such. These are great tools. Uh, but we see uh, it's lacking the capability of introducing this KRM model. So it lack, lacks the dynamic uh, assembly piece. So we cannot use live Kubernetes resources as source of information. So, the, so, the, so these uh, resources will not adapt dynamically based on what's on the Kubernetes layer. Uh, we don't have custom functions, so we, we cannot invoke arbitrary uh, code into this customized helm and templating. Um, lastly, it's following a partial KRM support. So not all resources involved follow the KRM approach. Uh, with that, I would like to hand over to Yoel. Uh, he will give you some demos uh, as well as uh, explain how this changes with the GitOps and KRM. Yeah. So now that we know that we cannot use um, these existing tools, uh, what do we actually want to use? So our proposal is to use, to embrace GitOps, use it as, as, it, is ha as it has been around for a while now but also to embrace KRM and to make this slide more cringe, um, we add an emo <laughs> a nice emoji there. So we think that's the dream team actually. Um, to show you an example of a real world um, scenario in Kubernetes that's actually something you're likely already using, we can have a look at the PVC controller and the stateful set controller of Kubernetes. So it all starts with a high level intent, um, which is our stateful set. This is a very simplified view, so don't, please don't um, judge us on it. It's just to prove the point. Um, the stateful set contains a persistent volume um, template, which defines uh, how, to, how to access the volume, read write once, read write many, and it actually defines the storage, the size you want. Um, this will be applied to the Cube API using GitOps. That's your default workflow. What happens after is, the stateful set controller will actually do the magic. It will cre create the PVC uh, in Kubernetes. It will wait for the PVC to be reconciled. Um, this PVC will be, will be reconciled by the persistent volume controller. Um, ask the storage backend to create such a storage. Uh, it will reflect the state in the PVC and only then the stateful set controller will be able to schedule its actual pod and run it on, on the or added to the Cube API. So that's more or less how this is done in Kubernetes. It's very simplified as said, but you can see um, it's already quite a dynamic approach and GitOps is only part of it. If we look at the same example from a source of truth point of view, we can see um, one part is in Git, which is the stateful set. Uh, it, it's, it's only that we use GitOps to sync this to the cluster. So that's how we get the source of truth from Git to the cluster. 
everything that happens after is dynamic on the cluster. So the PVC will be on, on the cluster dynamically. Uh, you will have a status of the PVC. You would have a persistent volume at some point with a PV ID and the actual pod. So source of truth is really um, shared. So the, the high level intent is stored in Git and the actual actuation or like that dynamics assembly is managed by Kubernetes. So that's quite important to understand. Um, so I think no one would like to check in the PVC ID to Git and manage this themselves, right? That's something you really don't want to do. And that's something that Kubernetes um, internals bring with them. That's why we like Kubernetes, right? Um, yes, before we go through an example of how we intend to expand on this pattern, uh, let's uh, have a look at an overview of, of the features. Uh, if we compare Git, plain GitOps with uh, GitOps with KRM. So the source of truth will be shared. Uh, it will be in, in Git, we only store the, the intent or the high level idea of what we try to do and Kubernetes will handle the, the dynamic state. We will have um, where we had this static paper map with all the details, with every, every detail in it. We only have the, the intent now in Git. So we simplify the manifest in Git quite a lot. Um, we think we are more flexible because we dynamically assemble these things in Kubernetes during runtime and we don't need to have it in a, in a Git checked in. And scalability should be better because we can reproduce the same thing multiple times so we can just instantiate more of the same. And we think that operational complexity will re reduce because we can really break the automation into single pieces such as where we, where, when you think about GitOps as the, the monolith where you have this big manifest, um, this way of automation is more like the microservices where you have small pieces of configuration that's, that kind of interact with each other. So let's have a look at the actual example we tried to showcase today. So um, you can scan this QR code for the slides and for the actual code examples. Um, so you, you uh, feel free to still take some pictures, but uh, behind this QR code, we will show it uh, a few times again. You can find everything, also uh, additional details that we don't show in the demo. So the example I'm going to talk about is um, dynamically creating Metal LV IP pools. So, and dynamically assigning IPs from an external IP address management system. So the first step is the input resource, which in this case is a config map or a custom resource. Um, we have different flavors, um, which contains a parent prefix. It's like an IP pool where, we, where we're able, able to take IPs and prefixes from and a prefix length. So in this case, it's slash 24, which will tell the system to get a slash 24 out of this parent prefix. We sync this to the cube API using GitOps. And then we have some dynamic config assembly, um, which will create a thing called prefix claim, similar to what we have with persistent volumes. We do the same uh, with prefixes, which takes these resources, applies them to the cube API. And then I need to very briefly introduce our uh, IP address management system. We're using a tool called Netbox. It's an open source tool as well um, for we're using that for IP address management on the 5G core. And what we did is we wrote the Kubernetes operator that is able to integrate this into the Kubernetes API. So we will have this netbox operator that will then make sure that we get a prefix based on the definition in this prefix claim. As soon as this is done, we will get a status update on the prefix claim where we can see we get the prefix. And when this is done, we can then finally render the output resource, which in this case is a MetalLB IP address pool. MetalLB is a load balancer for Kubernetes. And when this is done, we can apply it to the cluster. So that's a very simplified um, example that we use for showcasing uh, what, what we try to achieve with this dynamic approach. Um, we've looked at or we're showing you two different um, technology stacks now. 
Um, the first one is Ansible. We use Ansible because, um, or we, we had a look at Ansible because it was already heavily used in the 5G core. So um, Ashan talked about the smooth transition, like not this big bang change. Uh, so we hope that we can gradually move to a more dynamic approach by using Ansible. Um, and since we're already using Ansible in the 5G core automation, that should allow us to do so. So Ansible, if you don't know, it's an open source framework for automation. It's heavily used. Um, it uses Jinja templates for templating. And if you need additional imperative logic, you can use um, Ansible playbooks. Talking about state, Ansible itself is, uh, is kind of stateless. Um, in, in the case of Kubernetes, we need to rely on Kubernetes patterns for that, like Kubernetes garbage collection, owner references, and so on. Um, and Ansible itself is, in a way, just a binary, so there is no triggering, no runtime provided by Ansible out of the box. So if we want to integrate it into a more dynamic reconcil reconcil reconciling um, system, we would need something like Argo workflows, Argo events, Tekton, or similar. So looking at the same example again, um, our high-level intent is now a config map, so it's untyped. We will apply this to the Kubernetes cluster using GitOps in the demo. I will do it manually, but it doesn't matter too much. And then we manually need to trigger Ansible, the Ansible playbook. As soon as we do this, it will be able to render the prefix claim. It will apply to the cluster. It will wait for the netbox operator to be reconciled. And then as soon as this is done, it will render the output address pool and apply it to the cluster. So that's the very same example, uh, just with the specifics to Ansible. Um, I'm going to switch to the demo now. So in this um, window, I hope, is it big enough? Kind of. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, on the top, on the top part, you can see all re relevant resources. I do a. It, it's a watch that updates every 0 0.5 seconds. You can see config maps, configurations, and the netbox um, resource and the metalalby resource. So all the re relevant resources are there. Um, currently, we don't have any IP address pool. I can prove that by creating some load balancer uh, services. And you can see the IP uh, will be pending, so we don't get any IPs assigned. Um, <clears throat> what I do now is I change to the Ansible example and show you the input manifest. In this case, as mentioned, it's a, it's a config map, and it contains these two parameters, parent prefix and the prefix length. So if I now apply this resource, not much happens. It will apply a config map to the cluster. That's pretty much it. Since Ansible doesn't trigger itself, um, we now need to execute the Ansible playbook manually. That's something you would run in Argo workflows, for instance. As soon as this is done, you can see the prefix claim will be created. It will assign a prefix. And after some time, we will see the IP address pool and the Ansible playbook will um, be finished. Now I can run the exact same thing again, creating a few um, services of type load balancer. And you can see now that um, the subnets, the, the IPs that are assigned to these um, load balancers come from the exact subnets that, subnet that we assigned previously. So that seems to work uh, just fine. Uh, cleaning up is quite simple. We just need to delete the parent, the input resource, so the resource up here, the one that we applied at the very beginning. And since we're using owner references and garbage collection, everything else will be cleaned up by Kubernetes without the need to additionally interact uh, using Ansible. So that's, um, that's how we do it using Ansible. Um, as said, you can have a look at the example in the Git repo um, if you want to know more about the owner references and, and all that stuff. The second example, the second technology would, we would like to show is a plain Kubernetes operator. Um, so that's 
the standard way to interact with Kubernetes resources if you want to extend the Kube API. Um, in this case, we, we create the Kubernetes operator using Kube Builder uh, that's written in Golang. Golang is the most convenient way to write um, or language to write operators. Uh, you can use pretty much any language nowadays. Um, that's completely up to you, I guess. Um, the business logic will be written in code, in, in our case in Go code, that will give us maximum flexibility in what we do because it's code, right? Um, we also need to be responsible because we can also make it more complex. But uh, yeah, for this example, it's definitely fine. Um, state management, since we're uh, interacting with, with Kubernetes resources, uh, we can use the Kubernetes garbage collect collector and finalizers. That's uh, standard ways to interact with Kubernetes resources for, for uh, deletion and all that stuff. And last but not least, reconciliation is given because um, the operator itself hooks into, into the Kube API using a watch, so it will get informed as soon as any change happens on the resource. So that's a big advantage compared to Ansible uh, because we have the runtime, the, the operator is running on the cluster usually, and we have the triggering. So for each, so, so we have a nice event-based system with Kubernetes. So the same diagram again, um, in this case, the intent, the, the, the input resource, it's not a config map anymore. Uh, it's a CR of kind configuration. This allows us to, to do typing on the fields. We can, for instance, check for a valid CIDR and all that stuff. Um, we still apply this resource using GitOps to the cluster. And since it's an operator and it's watching the API, the operator will immediately trigger and do the same things that we had before. It will create a prefix claim, wait for it to be reconciled by the netbox operator, and then finally render the IP address pool and apply it to the cluster. So, um, seeing this in action, the first thing I will do is actually run the operator. I will for now run it locally on my machine or on my shell um, in the background so you, we can see whenever it's being, it's being triggered. So this is now running. Um, if we look at the input resource, as mentioned in this case, it's, a, it's not a config map anymore. It's a, it's a custom resource of current configuration, but it still holds the exact same um, spec or key values in the end. So in this case, when I apply this, um, this custom resource to the cluster, the operator will immediately trigger and create uh, everything that I've shown on the slide. So we, we will have the prefix claim and eventually we will get the IP address pool. And you can see it's a different CIDR, so we get a different network from, from, the, from the dynamic um, IP address management system. And to prove that it works, we can again create services of type load balancer, and you can see we get them from this 10.0.1.0.24. Deletion is the same, so we can clean up everything by just deleting this input resource because we again use owner references, which will tell Kubernetes how to clean up things. Um, yes, that's it. I'm cleaning up. I'm stopping the operator now. Um, and then we're back to normal. So we've just shown you two, two examples of how, uh, of how we can implement this hydra or this, this config rendering. There are advantages and disadvantages with both. Um, we've also looked at other tools like KPT, Crossplane, um, Helm. Helm also has some dynamic functionality, right? Uh, or K-Form, a more um, the, the newest kid on the block, I would say. Uh, but in the end, all of these tools have similar issues, or if, if not the same. So the bottom line for us after, after, um, after looking in, or after digging into this topic is that there is really no major, no mature Kubernetes native tool available to actually assemble these configs dynamically. 
And that's, for us, we think that's a problem that applies not only to our case on the 5G core, but it really applies to most of the cloud native tools. Um, scalability is very limited because we cannot really assemble these configurations in a, in a smart way. So we think the industry really needs to be become better, um, invest some money and some time into these topics to, to actually solve these problems um, in a better way. Yeah. And with that, I hand over to Ashan for lessons learned. Yep, thanks. So yeah, as you all mentioned, uh, it's not a telco specific uh, use case we are looking into. So a few learnings and suggestions from our end. So let's look into things to avoid first. Yeah, so uh, checking into low level configurations in Git, like IP addresses, VLANs, uh, we find it that it's a troublesome thing, so you'll, you might get in trouble uh, if you do that. Um, uh, and uh, introducing abstraction is needed, but only use it where it's needed. So if you add too much abstraction, it complexity increases. Uh, so you should avoid doing that. And also um, don't force tools that are not used um, or that are not designed with Kubernetes in mind. So shoehorning tools like Ansible, Jinja and such. Um, and also, uh, if there are challenges in the KRM, uh, it's, it, it may be not specific to your domain. Uh, so also, it's a, it's a common thing that uh, similar to what we have experienced. Uh, flipping this uh, on uh, aiming to do, uh, leverage abstraction. So strip any unnecessary configurations and focus on essential controls on Git. Uh, reuse cloud native tools uh, that are in band with Kubernetes, uh, Flux, Argo, uh, and also other tools like uh, Cert Manager and such. If you're de designing a KRM tool, uh, design it in mind that you need to grow and scale it into other use cases. And also, uh, lastly, uh, contribute to the ecosystem. So please share your code. And at Swisscom, we are uh, big with uh, community-driven uh, collaboration. Uh, so we have built our automation framework with multiple uh, open source tools, and also making use of CNCF tooling, very similar to Flux, for an example. Um, and also we would like to, uh, we are proudly giving back some of the stuff that we are working on. So one of the tools, it's already out there, driven by this uh, community called KubeNet. Uh, it's uh, led by uh, Wim Hendricks, also part of the Project Nephew. Uh, this tool specifically does uh, NetConf apply. So th for those who are from the telco uh, space, NetConf might be uh, very familiar to you. So it's a telco protocol. Uh, so this tool uh, enables you to apply the config in a cloud native way. Uh, if you're interested, the links are down below. So you can look into that. So the tool that uh, Yoel mentioned, the NetBox operator, uh, the tool, uh, this is designed to integrate NetBox uh, resource management directly into the Kubernetes layer. Uh, this is something that we've done uh, in-house and we have now open source it and you can find the, uh, the software in, in the NetBox community GitHub. And also we've written a CNCF blog post on how to use it. Yeah, so with that, I would like to uh, close the session by uh, referencing to a couple of other talks that we've done in the past. Uh, these are like uh, two of the foundation talks that lead, leads to this, uh, this presentation that we are doing today. So feel free to check it out and also provide us some feedback. Yeah, so thank you very much. And uh, I would like to open the round for the questions. We, we've got like five, six minutes left. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's for, it, I, I guess it's 40 minutes, yeah, the presentation. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, please. Yeah. yeah. For every type, you mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, uh, in Kubernetes operators, you can have um, an op one operator is like one or many controllers. So you can group them together. So in, in this case, we have a prefix claim controller and a IP address claim controller in the same operator. Yes, but in the end, you need to uh, implement the logic yourself. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I mean, cross crossplane is great if you have standard problems running on public cloud. I mean, for that, it's probably amazing because it, it helps a lot on abstracting these these things. But if you're going down the route with crossplane, writing your own providers for all the integrations you need for your corporate environment, maybe or your your company environment, then I'm not sure if you're better off just writing operators. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we can have a chat after the session as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, so, so, so the journey or where we are transitioning to is we have uh, Flux doing the deployment of the 5G applications. Uh, maybe for those who are not from the telco side, we also have different flavors of configuration. So day zero config for us is the deployment, and then uh, these deployments turning into net network services, we treat them as day one or day end config. So the, all the day one, day end configuration that we have, it's done using Ansible. So we have a Jinja template uh, generating the config and then it's uh, applied through this net config interface through Ansible playbooks. So the step, the middle point that we reached was to bring this configuration, ap applying the configuration in, in, in Kubernetes layer, so in bad Kubernetes. So that's where we introduced this SDC tool. So it's tied to the flux. So uh, right after deployment, it also reconciles the day one configuration. So day zero for us is Helm. Yep, yep, yep. And the, the step that we are tackling now is we are treating all the config as the same and now how are we simplifying the config? So rather than us spending hours preparing the configs, how can we dynamically assemble this config in the Kubernetes layer by passing a higher level intent and introducing this abstraction? And in order to do that, we are lacking a tool, uh, like a generic tool to tackle all these use cases. So that's, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice to hear that. <laughs> so I was wondering why didn't you try to get some of the threads that were operating the thread for that Like, for example, how any controller that can be deployed or in flux can be deployed. Yeah, I mean, um, it would certainly be an option. I think that that hasn't been. Uh -huh. I I think if I got it right, your your question was um, why why we don't why or if we considered it bypassing um, etcd and the Cube API by directly accessing um, these KRM objects from uh, from another source like Git, for instance, right? Is that more or less? <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try to answer it anyways. So I'm, I mean that it wasn't the focus for us up until now. Um, our assumption is uh, using GitOps and a tool like Flux or Argo CD 
is just fine doing exactly that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think, th I mean, there are other, there are other um, tools like the, like adding tenancy to, to the Cube API, for instance, would be one, one of the use cases um, that, are, that, that are also in interesting. But since we are not in a multi-tenancy um, environment, it doesn't matter too much. And I think the, the flux way of syncing manifests from a Git source to a cluster is just fine. And we, we can rely on that. I don't know, maybe you have some thoughts. No, I haven't looked into the, the, the approach that you're discussing. Maybe we can have a chat after the, this session. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, it sounds interesting. So yeah. definitely, if you have time after the session, yeah. we can have a have a chat. Yeah. I think there was one more question. I think we should have time for one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if I understood correctly, if our approach also applies to UPFs. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so what we presented was one of the uh, swim lanes, if we can call it. So this is about managing the uh, the 5G core, the CNFs. So the other part to the equation is how we manage the Kubernetes cluster. So we want to leverage the copy interfaces and then do the deployment and the lifecycle of the Kubernetes instances in, in the same fashion. And especially on the U UPF, uh, we also have this networking um, complexity, right? So you have to have this BGP logic added to the UPF function. So one, one thing that we are working on now is to um, do this um, peering to the gateways in a dynamic way. So we, we are automating the gateway configuration and also uh, tying that config into, or, the, tying, or reading the status fields of, the, of these resources that we, uh, used to configure the gateways and then making use of that to uh, do the BGP peering from the UPF function. So definitely that's a use case and it's a bit tricky one, uh, but uh, we are, that's something that we are looking into or working on. Yeah. yeah hopefully on the ne next session or next year we can present a solution. <laughs> <clears throat> so I think we are a bit over time. Yeah, I think we should wrap it up. If yeah. we, we will stay around. So Please approach us if you have questions. Thanks for uh, again for coming. Thanks for the interest. And, yeah, let's Thank you very much. Yeah.